Hello and welcome to Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we're talking about A Sun. Yes. Which is a Chinese film, or Taiwanese film. Yes. Uh, but Mandarin is the language spoken in the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, directed by Chong Meng Hong, uh, who made Parking in 2008, which is a film I've heard of, uh, and it won the Golden Lion. It was in in certain regard at Cannes Film Festival, but I've never seen it. You've not seen it either? I've not seen it either. Uh, This is my introduction. To Chong Meng Hong? Yes. This is on Netflix, and it got some press when Variety named it their film of the year, Hmm. of the top, like, 100. It was number one. And one of the things that was written in that short... Uh, review of it was that Netflix acquired this film and their PR people appeared to not even know that they'd acquired it. Oh it God. kind of speaks to Netflix all over in a sense. Like well, a con- a content farm. It speaks to Western well, there's that too. racism, really. <laughs> and this was recommended to us by a listener. There was an article, I think, on IndieWire that he sent to us, which and the article was, here's why you haven't heard of this great film. I, I must have not read it. Was that Richard? You sent that on to me. I know, but that doesn't mean I read it. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, so we put it on. It's two and a half hours, which is kind of fairly daunting, and it feels two and a half hours, I think. It does. But it has... It's like a kind of familial Shakespearean epic, Mm. I think. It grew on me a lot. Yes, in a very small scale, because it really is a family romance. It's just about the inner workings of a family, really. Yeah, Mm. that's all. But it does take on kind of, you know, it has all the sweep and tragedy and range of emotion. Initially, I would say it's worth watching, despite its daunting length and the certain slowness I think it has. I think it earns its length. Mm. Um, And it looks astonishingly beautiful. I love the lighting. I love how the camera is used so precisely at times. It's a geometrical... Uh, uh, precision mm. to some compositions that I think is just astonishing. I could be wrong, but it looks like it's shot on digital. And, you know, the interesting thing about digital is it has a particular kind of colour cr- chromatic. Or something. Yeah, mm. like There's a range of colours and an intensity of colours that I think the film deploys really well. Those overhead shots of just traffic going through uh, um, the streets, yeah, it kind of, I don't know, it felt like a kind of a neon rug or something. And the opening sequences alone, like, you know, when they're going through the streets, it does feel like digital, but usually I, I, I normally use that word uh, derogatory. derogatorily. Yeah. Um, whereas in this one, it seemed very... It seems to bring something... I think it has a crispness that I liked. Yeah. The images are in focus and they're sharp and beautiful. Yes. I think they've been graded very well as well. They, like... Whatever was there has been saturated, and and the boldness has been increased. Mm. Uh, the, it, images really pop off the screen. Yes, it's a film of surprises, right? Like yeah. Know. So let's start with the story then. Uh, this is this okay. is now we're in spoiler territory. Okay, so you start with the story then. Yeah, I'll, sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll you start with the story, and then I'll I'll talk about the opening shots. Sure. So the story in general is uh, there's a family: father, mother, two sons, uh, who are teens, and the one son. Uh, hangs around with a guy who appears to not be a great influence. A man's hand is chopped off by the son and this guy almost immediately, and it falls into hot soup. And you went, oh, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I didn't expect this. Um, the son and the guy, and this guy, Radish, his name is, get sent to uh, juvenile detention. Different mm. places, though. So they split up. Um And after a couple of years, the son comes out and tries to kind of restart his life. Meanwhile, the dad refuses to acknowledge that his son exists, Mm. really. And actually, at that hearing, when he's being sentenced, the dad says, send him down for as long as possible. Mm. You can sort of see... like He he only arrives just in time to, to say to the judge, give him as much time in prison as you can. You can really see, I think, the kind of familial dynamics that have already led this guy to a position where he is being... Detain, mm. uh, in juvenile detention. The mother is more caring, goes to see him in juvenile detention. Uh, there's also a baby on the way that he's not told about until much later. So all these kind of dynamics start start arising, and also there's the young, there's the uh, older son. I think, mm. I think he's older. Yes, he is. He's kind of more shy, more retiring. But I think if there's a son, as the title suggests, he is it. Mm. He's sunshine and brightness and lightness. Although he himself says. 
he feels that that deprives him of like a dark corner inside himself. Mm. He says where well, he has no place to hide, mm. which is interesting. So like everyone's life in this is complicated, and everyone mm. has these competing things going on. Yeah. So let me let me restart a bit because. You know, so the beginning of the film ends with these two kids in a motorcycle in this neon noir kind of setting. Two seconds in, and a hand's been chopped off, and there's this man kind of with blood splaying all over the place, kind of, you know, wriggling around on the floor. And the very next shot is the hands on a soup, right? And you think, oh my God, like, you know, you can't believe what you're seeing. And it's one thing after another, like, you think it can't be topped, right? Like, it's yeah. so sudden, right? Um... And actually, I thought that was very interesting because from then on, the film will work in different ways. I mean, one of the um, narrative strategies that I found so interesting is that the film makes you wonder, what is this doing here? What's happening? Yeah, what is in that bag? Right? Mm. And only tells you later. It's a very interesting kind of narrative strategy. Yeah, like I, you know, I was often asking you, what's happening? Who is he? And it's not because I was too thick to get it or that I missed something. It's actually that the film tells you later. So I think that's something, you know, very interesting and very uncommon, really, actually, in, in, in film. That a film keeps you waiting so long to find out something that there's no obvious reason to hide. Like, you know, so for example, at the beginning, when we were asking, who is that kid? Yeah, is that, is that the brother? Like, you know, it, it's only like several scenes mm. later that you, it's confirmed that he is, in fact, the brother, right? And there's no particular reason to to not let you know right away, in, yeah, in mm. some way, um, except, I suppose, to keep you asking questions, <laughs> yeah, to, to, to have that mode of viewing where you're constantly asking questions. But I thought that was very uh, interesting. And the film is also very episodic, and it often... Tells rather than dramatizes, I think. Okay, how so? For example, the whole scene with the girlfriend and, you know, how you're told it's the girlfriend and she's pregnant and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you can't go visit until you're married. You're told all of those things. Yeah. In dialogue. In dialogue, Mm. yeah. Uh, And often it's one character telling another, which is not to say that it's not dramatic or that it's not emotional, but it's certainly... Quirky, yeah? Not the usual way that you expect to see uh, scenes unfolding. Hmm. Although, it's something that you would tend to associate with bad filmmaking. Um, Telling, not showing. You would, but not in the way that this film does it. Hmm. You know? Because it makes the act of telling dramatic. It makes the act of telling emotional, yeah? Mm. I mean, the whole last scene with the mother and the father after the walk at the top of the hill, mm-hmm. that's pure telling. Yes, yeah. it is. You know, and it's, at the same time, it's very moving. Or I mm. found it very moving, yeah? It's kind of, you know, this man realizes that he has been ignoring his son and thus punishing him and, you know, now, that, now wants to save him and has done, you know, has gone to the furthest extreme, you know, to, to save him in ways that he himself can't understand. Right, so all that becomes very, very moving at the end of the film. But mm. it is it is telling. <laughs> yeah. Um, the father, I think, is the most interesting character for me. Because he's the character who... He definitely loves his son, but... he. In fact, it's, it's not unlike... We were just talking about the Rocky movies before. It's not unlike Mickey, where he says the reason that he took away Rocky's locker and the reason that he treats him like crap is because he could have been something and he wasn't. And mm. that is how this dad feels about his son here. His son... Could have been something, but he fell prey to bad influences. Maybe, though. I think the film makes it clear that actually this father has never had much time for that son. That he's been so heavily invested in his older, more beautiful, more intelligent, more successful son. Mm. That he's just, like, you know, not even bothered with that one. And actually, that in the act of not bothering, he has made the bad aspects of his son unfold yeah yeah the second half of the film after the son has been released from prison um and is trying to make his way in the world that's when that's when i started to get really interested in the film um beyond its visuals i kind of struggled with it i think for the first half i i was into it from the beginning because i was into it you know the dynamic of the father was very interesting um the older son building this relationship with this girl was interesting and mysterious uh, and interestingly shown. 
So, you know, when they're going through that corridor to the bus stop, I thought, oh, she's going to be assaulted. Like, who makes corridors like that? Like, you know, <laughs> it's like the worst underground, you know, that you've ever seen. Mm. I mean, narrow and without escape, seemingly. You know, so, so, so I was kind of quite tense during all of that. The prison scenes, you know, how he was going to um, establish his place, you know, in the pecking order of the prison. Though, actually, you're not shown much of a pecking order. You're just shown the new guy getting beaten. Um... I thought all of that was very interesting. I found cross-cultural things interesting, right? Like, you know, so I was saying it uh, as we were watching that one of the interesting things about watching foreign films is that, you know, you don't know the conventions and you don't know the mores and, you know, you have a little bit of trouble making sense of people's relationships with each other because you're not picking up the clues, mm -hmm. right? So, of course, that's a handicap in one way, but it's also fascinating in another. So, I mean, I was just interested in the prison clothing, right? Yeah. yeah, you realize that it must be a very tropical or wet climate, right? So, you know, they're all wearing T-shirts and, you know, and sandals. And so yeah. obviously a very humid place, you know, so the types of uniforms that they wear are very different. The range of policing where someone actually listens in on your conversation and that you actually name yourself, you know, for future reference in the recording mm. is like... Out of 1984, yeah, it's, I found it very mm. all of that very interesting. The fact that girlfriends are not allowed to visit, you know, I mm. thought that was interesting as well. So, I mean, the whole film is really about how one action, yeah, the hand that falls into the soup, <laughs> affects this whole family and continues to have repercussions way after the initial action, right, on all of the mm -hmm. family's life. And so, you know, the film picks up kind of the first this trend and then another and then you know kind of the girlfriend and then the brother you know because the suicide comes as a surprise yeah you know? like kind of it seems to come out of nowhere and it's only retroactively that you make sense of it right why does this handsome man who's kind of starting to court this girl who's obviously really nice who's kind to you know the 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 girlfriend of his brother uh, why does he jump off you know, a high building and kill himself, really. Like, it doesn't make sense. Or did it to you? It made sense to me. He, it, I mean, he feels pressure. Well, okay. It eventually made sense to me that he, the, the, the father was putting too much pressure on mm. him. Yeah, make your own path, you know, and so on and so forth. So actually, you know, kind of the poor father is blamed for ha the delinquency of one son and the suicide of the other. Um, and in the film's terms, not without reason. Yeah, but actually, I didn't realize at that point that the father was putting so much pressure on him. Well, that's, by that point, he's he's spoken, as I said, this thing about the dark corner that he he, he doesn't he's not able to retreat to True. in his mind. Yes, um, you know, but I, you could see that as a further stage in the development of his relationship with the girl. You know, you don't see that in itself as a um, a, a rationale for suicide, or I didn't. Well, you not know. exactly, but it's something he's expressing about himself. Yeah, yeah. That's and it, quite unusual to hear. True. And again, that makes sense later. Yeah? yeah. When you're putting the pieces together, you see that there's a clue in that. But at that moment... Well, at that moment, it made sense to me because it struck me straight away. Oh, well. So, okay. um, anyway, what I was saying about the second half of the film, though, because it, cause you're right that the film is about this, this single action that, that reverberates and, mm. and has kind of repercussions down the years. But the reason that, it, that it, it really started to take me in the second half was because... That's when the kid, who has good intentions and a good heart, essentially, is trying to make a go of it and still there are obstacles in his way. I mean, you sure. see right at the start when he's trying to get a job and he has to mention that he's been to ju juvie and the guy goes, oh, no, don't know about that. And you, this guy eventually takes a chance on him and gives him the, the, the chance at the car wash. And then, you know, three years pass uh, as the on-screen title tells you, he's clearly doing a decent job because he's still there and, you know, he's handling very expensive cars and mm -hmm. all this, he can be trusted. And then, you know, you can't outrun your past, right? So the thing that I love is when you know who Radish, Radish is with. coming back to see him. But and I love the lighting when he goes to open the shutter in the car wash and you know he's there, but mm. you haven't seen him yet. And just this red light mm. swamps him from mm. outside. And it's like, you know, this, this devilish uh, you know, influence is standing there shining on him and then you see it's Radish and and the way that Radish looks as well with this with this bleach blonde hair that's completely out of place mm. and then this dark glasses that he puts on later like he thinks he's Takashi Miike mm. you know 
a, a, such an amazing presence that comes back and you know he's going to start turning things sour again after things have pretty much you know, been gradually improving yeah. for this guy. Yeah, he's built his life, but out of the past comes his nightmare. Yeah, and he's even vaguely reconciled with his dad. Yeah. Uh, outside the um, the convenience store where he's taken a second job. Mm. Well, oh. the film ultimately goes on to ask, is some crime justified or, or indeed moral? Yes. Um, because what happens is the dad, once he's discovered that Radish is out of prison because uh, he got a longer sentence than, than his son, he's like can't sleep and can't go to work and starts following him around, doesn't even know why he's doing it, starts following his son around, that is. Mm. And then Radish turns up and there's this thing about Radish making his way into the car wash, sitting inside expensive cars, basically taking liberties, and the kid is very quickly kind of seduced back, although he's not happy about it. The kid mm. knows that, that he shouldn't be allowing Radish to do this, that, and the other, but he kind of can't help it. And then in seeing them, uh, quote-unquote, borrow an expensive car and take it out of Bentley, and seeing Radish left alone after he sends the son on some criminal errand can't stop himself from running the guy over in his car yes. and dumping the body and this does free up the sun it ends right like radish is nothing but a bad deal mm. in this kid's life yeah a threat. and the film asks you to to weigh that up mm. i think it's interesting that the very ending of the film is the son uh, saying to the mum should we go out for a walk and then they steal a bike and the mum's not happy about this when did you learn to, to pick locks and so on when they steal this bike, well, again, borrow it, as, mm. as he says, um, and, you know, enjoy this bike ride together. And the film kind of asks, is that all right? <laughs> well, it's more than that, because the mother uh, had, if you remember the dialogue with the girlfriend's aunt, where they were saying, what can you tell me about your son before I allow them to marry? And, you know, she's very straightforward and lists all his faults. And, you know, but then there's this whole thing about how he used to love riding in the back of a bike, mm. right? And how he wanted her to drive for hours and hours and hours. And it was both an irritant and a bond, right? Mm. So so it ends with that bond with the mother. Yeah. Mm. But it took crime, took low-level crime to, to allow that bond right at the end. Yes. And the film is asking, you know, is it okay to steal this bike for a minute? Well, I think the film is saying that it is okay, mm. you know, uh, and that the father's actions, you know, are extreme, but also understandable. And yeah, it's kind of, mm. yeah, it's an interesting, it's a little bit like um, the guy in jail waking up in the middle of the night to bash the bully's face. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like, you know, those are things, yeah, they're survival, they're, ne- they're necessary for survival, however yeah. morally questionable. And actually it's asking, what does it take to be a good person? And because I think of, like specifically of the dad, it's asking, you know, so this guy's killed someone, but he's killed someone for the good of his son. Yes. And is that being a good person? You yes, know? because, you know, he. you could argue that he also killed his eldest son. Yeah. Mm. In spite, yeah, killed him with love. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one, he didn't do, like he didn't pull the trigger on one, but, you know, he is held responsible for it. The other one, he did consciously so that his son could live, you know. Mm. Um, do you think, I suggested earlier that the film earns its length. Do you, do you agree with that? I, in, you know, whilst watching it, I thought it was very long, right? I mean, I stopped the film, you know, because I, I, I thought it was almost over, actually. And I just wanted to see, you know, and... There was an hour and ten to go. Yeah, I thought there was another <laughs> ten minutes and there was an hour and ten, right, to go. So there's a little bit of, oh, when is this going to end? And then there are moments where you think, okay, the film has ended now, right? Like, Mm. you know, I thought when the guy was beaten up and left in the highway with some money thrown, I thought, you know, there'll be another minute and, you know, he'll go home or, you know, meet his parents or and the film is over. And then it continues for... (laughs) The shot from overhead of him running along the highway with his mm. money in his pocket and the music that's playing completely has the feel of the last shot of the film. Yeah. Which I would have thought would have been a disappointing ending because I thought there was, you know, there other stuff that needed to be resolved but it felt like an ending. Yeah. And then you go, oh no, there's going to be more. Well, you know, I think other stuff needed to be resolved but you could have done it in like a montage of 30 seconds or whatever. Um, 
So, but the film extends. But actually, I, then I also think it earns those extensions, mm. you know. Yeah, so I, I actually thought the film would have ended satisfactorily on that shot that you're speaking of, actually. You know, because that's the end. That's the end, right? <laughs> Except then, you know, it's not the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, we don't. We wouldn't. We wouldn't know that the dad had done it. Had yeah. done that. So, and that brings another dimension. And then the putting out the book scene adds another dimension. Where was it? Seize the day, or seize the day, find your path, which yeah. is a phrase that is on all these diaries, one year after another. That he, that the dad has given to the elder son, and the son didn't use it at all. But it was just this, he kept on doing it, and it's also the phrase that is over. The um, it's like on a banner on his driving school, mm. and he says it a lot. It, it, it the whole film is coated you know, in this phrase, to the point where the mum says, "Stop saying it. It's annoying everyone." Yes, <laughs> um, you know, I you know we're working people. What day <laughs> are we meant to see? <laughs> right, like yeah. Uh, but uh, you do feel that like as the kind of it, it, it's a film about about parenting, and you totally feel the dad's wanting to impart this to his son. Yeah. Seize the day, it's your opportunity, find your path. And, mm. and then and actually the film is showing you this path that mm. not entirely through his own doing, the son has been put on. Yeah. I think we haven't talked enough about the mother. And I want to talk about her because, you know, she is the heart of the whole thing. And really because of constancy. Yeah, it's the constancy of her attention which is like a, a backbone to the whole family, right? So she's the one who is working in this very dodgy you know, place doing makeup and hair mm. for what look to be either prostitutes or dancing girls or something like that. Because even she later says, you know, the reason why I want to open a shop is because the kid is too young to work where I'm working now, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, but she's the one who makes sure that the girl is taken in, that the child is born, that the son is visited... Mm. Yeah, that, you know, uh, a business has started where, you know, her yeah her mm -hmm. daughter-in-law can raise a child. I think it's kind of quite uh, an amazing characterization, which seems peripheral, but actually I think it's very central. And thus the ending of the mother and son, rather than, as you might have expected in a celebratory mode, with the father <laughs> and son. Yeah. So I thought all of that was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> the last thing you say of the dad is on, the, on that hilltop isn't it where he talks about hmm. where he says what he's done to the wife that's the last you see of him um, so the last you see of him with his son must have been at the at the convenience store I'm not sure they had a scene together after that um, they don't have a scene together I mean you have the flashback mm. which is all about the father looking after the son yeah right without the son knowing uh, and of course the confession of the crime um, but that's interesting because actually you think right what you're saying is you'd expect you might expect uh, the, the father and son to have their reunion at the end but actually that that reunion or reconciliation has happened outside the convenience store but that's been like more than half an hour from the end probably a lot more I didn't yeah. keep tabs on it quite a long way from the end and then actually <laughs> what you're seeing after that is the dad's actions since that reconciliation and actually what that reconciliation has you know, kind of uh, driven him, uh, maybe not driven, but allowed him to do, or encouraged him to do, or just the different way that he sees his son now. But also, interestingly, the dynamic towards the father has changed because there's that lovely moment where they find out those diaries, like what was it, face the future, or choose your path, or <laughs> seize the day, seize find the your day. path. I think is find, what it was. yeah, seize the day, find your path, and the mother tells him, make sure your father doesn't see those, mm. right? And it's a very protective moment, right? Because you know, you don't want to hurt your father's feelings, right? So there's a complicity <clears throat> now in protecting the father, yeah? Mm. So the father is brought back into the family in a different way, mm. yeah? And rather than being afraid of him or, you know, fearing his wrath or, you know, his silence or whatever, now there's just a, like a keeping the father psychically safe, you know? <laughs> psychically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, that's interesting storytelling, actually, because, because it's... It, it, takes a moment that you might expect to find at the very end and then finds more story to tell after it mm. that is interesting. Mm. Anyway, shall we wrap up? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a visually very beautiful film. Um, mm. I think it's a really complex film. And actually, when, when I was watching it, again, it's funny because, you know, we've just been talking about the Rocky films. 
And uh, I feel that, you know, like the Rocky films, this film is about things that are important in life, yeah? Kind of, you know, family dynamics, relationships between fathers and sons, mm. and moral and ethical questions of how to be and how to act, you know, the repercussions that one bad act can have, not only on yourself, because there's always this thing of, you do the crime and, you know, you pay the price or whatever the saying is. You do the time. You do the crime, you do the time. Well, actually, maybe you doing the crime affects not only you, and then everybody else does time or penance or punishment because of your actions, right? So the mm. film kind of, yeah, offers a complex understanding of that. But it's still, you know, it's interesting because it's like a kind of a, a morality tale and an exploration of family. And it's kind of things that make you question your own life and your own relationships and your own actions, right? And I do think that in a way, films have always been about that. But actually, for me, every time I see a film like this, it takes you by surprise because actually so much of what you see really isn't about that. Yeah, mm. that kind of it's a happy encounter. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter at Eavesdrop Movies, and the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. <laughs>